Thanks to CuriosityStream for keeping Legal Eagle in the air, which now comes with Nebula for free. Get 40% off of both with a documentary distancing discount. Link in the description. Oh, here, here, here. For the best thing he's done, it's worth just bringing up. So the music video, Here Kitty Kitty, about Carol killing her husband. You have to admit that these songs are a little catchy. Hey, Legal Eagles, it's time to think like a lawyer because today we are covering Tiger King. And oh man, this one almost broke me. There are so many legal issues to go into, so many legal acts. These people really needed better lawyers. If you don't know, Tiger King is the documentary about a bunch of zoo owners who take care of big cats like tigers, lions, and ligers. Feels a little sensationalized uh, because this is really only the tip of the iceberg. I had to do a whole bunch of extra research to dig into the various court cases that this created. Truth is really stranger than fiction. About an hour ago, we had an incident where one of them employee stuck their arm through the cage and the tiger tore her arm off. I can give you your money back or I can give you a rain check. And spoilers, we're gonna go into the murder, the conspiracy, the tigers, and even trademark law. So be sure to comment in the form of an objection, which I will either sustain or overrule, and stick around until the end of the video where I give Tiger King a grade for legal realism. So without further ado, let's dig in to Tiger King. Here is a fact that may make you stop for a second. There are more captive tigers in the U.S. today than there are in the wild throughout the world. And you would not believe how many sheriffs told me, oh yeah, just down the street, there's a guy that has a lion or a guy down there that has a tiger. They just feel very strongly that these are mine and nobody's gonna take them from me. Okay, so right off the bat, let's talk about the legality of owning big cats because a ton of people reached out to me and asked how it was even possible that these crazy people could own these lions and tigers. Well, the reason is because there's no federal law that actually bans the private ownership of big cats. There is a patchwork of state laws that some ban uh, outright ownership of big cats, some require uh, regulations for owning big cats, but there's no federal law that says you can't own big cats. So whether you personally can own a big cat like Joe Exotic depends largely on what state you live in and whether that state prohibits the ownership of wildlife. Now, there are some federal laws that do provide some regulation in this context, like the Endangered Species Act, which prohibits the sale of big cats without a permit from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Department. Uh, and in 2016, there was actually a case that applied the Endangered Species Act not only to animals that are found in the wild, but also to animals that are held in captivity. So that's a relatively new part of this law. And then there's the Animal Welfare Act, which sets certain minimal standards for actually caring for a lot of these animals and, and big cats and requires you to get a permit to exhibit these things to the public. And uh, interestingly, Tim Stark, who is featured later on in this documentary, had his permit permanently revoked by uh, the federal government, so he can't exhibit animals to the public anymore. And it probably won't surprise you that Oklahoma has some of the laxest laws in the United States when it comes to owning exotic animals, which is why Joe Exotic was able to have his zoo in Oklahoma. There's always been a rumor out there that Doc Antel euthanizes his cubs when he's done with them. We've had whistleblowers come to us and say that they've heard a gunshot in the middle of the night and the next day there's no cat, but they don't know where the cat went. Yeah, so there are all kinds of allegations in this documentary, not just that Joe Exotic, but other zoo owners would kill the big cats once they were no longer young enough to be handled by the general public. You can imagine that once they get to be a certain age, uh, they become ferocious killing machines and are no longer cuddly animals that you can hold in your hands. And so once they lose their economic value, effectively the zoo owners would euthanize them. And under most circumstances, it is illegal to kill big cats under the Animal Welfare Act. So, uh, spoiler alert, one of the things that Joe is eventually convicted of is a violation of this act because he's accused of killing a bunch of tigers without a permit. They said that Joe had shot five tigers and they dug them up and found the skulls. So there's a big difference between being able to actually legally own one of these animals and being able to take care of it or being able to euthanize it. Those are very separate questions. I told Joe, how are you gonna make money? How are you gonna make money? How are you gonna make money? He didn't have any other way to make money other than cub petting, so he had to breed. They only are hour old. 
This is another question that kept cropping up in terms of whether you're allowed to breed these big cats. And uh, under federal law, as long as you have a USDA license, you can in fact breed big cats. Uh, though some states in particular have banned breeding uh, for obvious reasons, because it's ripe for abuse. So again, there's a difference between federal law and state law in terms of whether you're allowed to breed them. There's no federal law that, that, that says you can't as long as you have a permit, uh, but a lot of states do in fact prohibit that. Got an employee that was attacked by a tiger, and he's hurt bad. The arm is completely gone. We do not have time to wait. Go so get your gun in there. Get everything out of the out of the driveway. You all right? Oh, this is such a sad affair where the employee was so grievously injured. In terms of whether the zoo is liable, states again differ in terms of how they impose liability for injuries that are caused by these exotic animals. Some states uh, hold the zoos uh, what's called strictly liable, which means that as long as there is an injury related to the animals, the zoo is responsible, regardless of whether they were negligent or not. Other uh, states require that the zoos be actually negligent in terms of uh, an employee being injured or not. You can imagine that based on some of the things that are in this documentary, it probably wouldn't be too hard to show that uh, Joe and some of the other staff at the zoo might have been negligent in terms of allowing this person to be injured. I've been doing this 20 years, never even been bit. Ah. It's okay. But we don't have all of the facts in this particular case. I think this documentary made it a point not to show too much of the footage related to this employee being injured. There might be defenses the, the zoo might have, like contributory negligence or assumption of risk, where perhaps the employee might not have been exercising all of the caution that she should have been using. So it's not necessarily an open and shut case. And just because you have a legal claim or a lawsuit on your hands doesn't necessarily mean that you're gonna recover anything. There've been so many lawsuits against Joe Exotic in the GW Zoo that it's entirely possible that even if this employee won the lawsuit that she might not be able to recover anything. That's called being judgment proof. And it's unfortunately a sad reality where sometimes the guilty party just doesn't have any funds to compensate an injury for someone that deserves it. It's probably gonna get me in trouble, but uh, it's uh, eat off the meat truck. It was a truck that picked up meat <laughs> from all these Walmarts in the area that had expired. Joe would let them kick out what they wanted first. They'd carry bags of this expired meat and foods back to their mobile home, and that's what they ate. Oh my God. This violates so many health and safety codes and OSHA in so many different ways. I'm not even gonna go into it. Uh, this is actually worse than Willy Wonka's sweatshop factory, which I covered in an episode of Laws Broken. So if you wanna know how many laws Willy Wonka and the chocolate factory broke, uh, you can check out that episode. Spoiler alert, it's a lot of laws. I was the power of attorney for both of them. Who was the power of attorney on the new documents Carol produced? Not me. That new power attorney gave her control over the estate. Ah, the will and the power of attorney being changed in a very suspicious way right before Carol's husband goes missing. At first blush, this I think looks pretty terrible, but I don't think that this is nearly as bad as it appears, and, and hear me out on this. As it happens, you cannot execute a durable power of attorney without two witnesses and a notary, and the notary will actually record that they witnessed the, the signatures being provided. Uh, now, that law actually changed in 2011, where uh, now under Florida, durable and non-durable powers of attorney have to be with two witnesses and a notary. Uh, before that, only durable powers of attorney, meaning that uh, a power of attorney that applies when someone is incapacitated or goes missing, for example. So I think the law at the time required two witnesses and a notary, which means it's unlikely that there was any foul play involved and uh, her husband would have had to have signed off on this particular uh, power of attorney. So it probably was not uh, executed posthumously. Now, on top of that, there is this potentially suspicious language about kicking in when the person disappears. That doesn't seem like something that often happens. Isn't it suspicious that the power of attorney says, upon my disappearance? Is that normal verbiage? I have, in 37 years, never seen it say, or disappearance. Never have. 
I actually did a little bit of research uh, to find out if this disappearance language is normal. And as it happens, I was able to find another power of attorney that mentions disappearance, which makes sense. If uh, someone is incapacitated, if they go into a coma, if they disappear, if they are killed, that's when you want a durable power of attorney for someone to be able to take care of the things in the estate. The documentary seems to indicate that it's only applicable in disappearance. I think that they sort of cherry picked this one section. I would bet that the, the rest of the power of attorney mentions a whole bunch of different situations where the power of attorney kicks in. So I could be wrong. I don't have all of the facts, but I don't think this is nearly as suspicious as it's portrayed in the documentary. I got a phone call stating that the office alarm had gone off and Carol was there. Her and Kenny Farr had cut the locks on the gate, cut the locks on the office. The will and the power attorney, they were all taken out of the office that day. So we talked about the potentially suspicious language of the power of attorney. Now, a lot of those accusations came from Anne McQueen, Don's uh, old assistant, uh, who talks about a lot of these things and certainly casts aspersions on Carol Baskin. Interestingly, there was a conservatorship case for Don's estate that accuses Anne McQueen of embezzling $600,000 from Don's properties. If indeed these allegations are true, that certainly paints her uh, aspersions in a different light and would explain why Carol did not want Anne accessing all of the documents that were in Don's office. But this is Florida, so I assume some light embezzlement is probably okay. Joe decided that the way he would get back at us was to rename his traveling show Big Cat Rescue Entertainment. Here's our logo, all right? And here is what he started using. All right, now we get into the real sexy stuff, the trademark infringement cases. Uh, so I had to look into this. Uh, there were uh, federal lawsuits filed. There were some trademark cases and there were some copyright cases. And from what I can tell, the trademark infringement suit is basically as it's portrayed in the documentary. Carol Baskin had the trademark to Big Cat Rescue for a very long time. And then it appears that Joe Exotic wanted to create confusion between Big Cat Rescue and his own entertainment company. Joe started realizing if he made his name close to the Big Cat Rescue, when they Google it, it might pull him up first. You're not allowed to do that. That's the entire point of trademark. Trademark exists to prevent consumer confusion. And a trademark is not necessarily the graphics, although it can include uh, the graphics, but it also includes just the word mark itself. So <laughs> Big Cat Rescue versus Big Cat Rescue Entertainment that's gonna be a slam dunk trademark case for trademark infringement, false designation of origin and unfair competition. It's not surprising then that Carol got a judgment for close to a million dollars, $953,000, because Joe couldn't help himself and he probably admitted that he tried to uh, create confusion between the two entities. The one lawsuit was about the rabbit photo and the other lawsuit was about a bunch of photos where he would take a picture of Carol and take her head and put it on the body of a man in a diaper. So these copyright cases, uh, and th there are at least two of them, possibly three copyright cases, are a little different from the trademark case that we just talked about. So this may or may not be meritorious, but Joe obviously uh, would use graphics in his reality TV show and his internet videos. And he may not have been using them in a fair use way. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Joe Exotic, and we're gonna make an honest woman out of this And what Carol did is sort of diabolical and genius because what she did is she went and tracked down the people that took the photos that Joe used. So maybe they were posted on Facebook or on the internet and she would track down the people who took the photos of Big Cat Rescue or her husband or herself. And she would buy the rights to those photos. She would get what's called a copyright assignment. And then with the ownership of the copyright procured, she then sued Joe for copyright infringement for using the photos that then she had the rights to. Carol Baskin, credit where credit is due. It's clever. She'll never get a million dollars out of me. I don't own anything. I don't own anything. This bus is not mine. <laughs> Those cars are not mine. <laughs> not stupid. <laughs> okay. 
This may be my favorite part of all of Tiger King. You can keep the conspiracy to commit murder. You can keep the tigers and lions. My favorite thing are the fraudulent transfers. Joe kept thinking if he changed the name, it would just derail him and derail him. Well, it didn't. They just moved it to another lawsuit. Contrary to what Joe and, and uh, Jeff Lowe say, you can't avoid judgments uh, or avoid lawsuits just by changing the name of the company or uh, just taking the assets and moving them somewhere else. That's called a fraudulent transfer. It creates what's called a constructive trust over the transferred assets. So if you take possession of those assets, that were fraudulently transferred, um, the person who is uh, rightfully owning that property, which as, as we saw, Carol got a judgment for almost a million dollars. So she could have gotten almost everything that the GW Zoo owned. That person can then claw back all of that uh, property that was transferred somewhere else. So what I think happened here is that Joe Exotic's mom, uh, Shirley Shrevogel, wasn't sued per se, but what it looks like is that Joe put some documents in front of her where uh, it, on paper, transferred the assets of the zoo itself or the things that the, the zoo owned and put it in her name. I went down to the courthouse and got a, one, a copy of one of the deeds and I said, Grandma, are you, are you aware that this happened? And she said, well, he shoved a paper in front of me and told me to sign it. I didn't think anything of it. Obviously, uh, when they signed these documents and engaged in the knowingly or unknowingly in a fraudulent transfer with Joe, their involvement almost certainly required a lawyer. And it really seemed like she rubber stamped things that she really shouldn't have been uh, rubber stamping. Shirley's name is on everything. The trailers, the water bill, the electric bill, the cable, you know, cable bills. Yeah, you can't get away with that. And uh, I'm sorry that, uh, that Joe seemingly took advantage of her, but Shirley Shrevogel did sign a settlement agreement with Big Cat Rescue Corp, which is the one owned by Carol Baskin, not the, uh, the fake one owned by Joe, where she uh, agreed that she had engaged in these transfers. So let that be a lesson to all of those parents out there. Don't sign paperwork just because your kids put it in front of you. They might be engaging in fraud especially if they live in Florida. One time I was on the park and Joe's talking to me. He says, hey, I hear you can take care of a problem for me in Florida. And I said, what problem would that be? He said, Carol Baskin. I said, no, I can't. All right, now we're getting into the real juicy stuff here, the conspiracy to commit murder. Now, you might be wondering, when does idle chit chat go from mere conversation into a conspiracy to commit murder? Well, under 18 USC 1958, which is the use of interstate commerce facilities in the commission for murder for hire, it applies whenever someone travels or causes another to travel uh, between states. And, and that's sort of a relic of um, federalism and that a lot of federal statutes only apply in interstate situations so that they don't interfere with uh, state-based laws. But as long as you use uh, the mail or interstate commerce uh, with the intent that a murder be committed in violation of the laws of the United States, or if you exchange anything of pecuniary value with anyone who conspires to commit such an act. You're guilty of uh, effectively attempted murder. And under 18 USC 371, which is the federal statute that deals with conspiracy, all that you need to do is uh, conduct one overt act in furtherance of that conspiracy. And that overt act does not need to be one of the elements of that offense. So it's a pretty low burden. Certainly paying $3,000 would definitely be considered an overt act in furtherance of a conspiracy to commit murder. But I think this documentary is conflating a couple different things. There are the things that are required to prove the crime, and then there are the things that the US attorneys want so that they have an easy time proving the crime. And those are not necessarily the same things. When I do become a psychotic, that's my going to Tampa gun. Really just the fact that the guy uh, started driving towards Carol Baskin probably would have been enough in its own right to convict both of these people of conspiracy to commit murder. I was like, hey, Joe, this is my guy. This is the guy who will whack Carol for you. Really? How much? 
You know, when I said I was gonna do a reaction to Tiger King, I got so many comments from people that said that uh, Joe was set up and that uh, the government had committed entrapment. While entrapment is a defense, it's very, very rarely applicable. And a valid entrapment defense has two elements. One, you have to prove that the government induced the crime itself. And two, you have to prove the defendant's lack of predisposition to engage in the criminal conduct. In other words, that the government put the idea of the crime itself into the defendant's head. And that's just simply not the case here, at least based on what we're seeing in this documentary. I, I don't think Joe has any reasonable grounds to claim that he was a victim of entrapment. Well, everything was fine, just as sweet as wine, but her husband went and disappeared. But then it got a little crazy, it got a little hazy, and the cops said there's something wrong here. Oh, here, kid, kid. But the best thing he's done, it's worth just bringing up. So the music video here, Kitty Kitty, about Carol killing her husband. You have to admit that these songs are a little catchy. A lot of people were, were asking about whether Carol Baskin could have a defamation claim against Joe Exotic based on the fact that he's basically accusing her of killing her ex-husband. Funny story about these songs. Uh, Joe isn't the one singing in these songs. The songs were actually recorded by uh, two individuals named Vince Johnson and Danny Clinton, who were two musicians from Washington State. Apparently, they reached out to Joe Exotic, and from my understanding, they were paid in influence. I don't think that Carol Baskin could have a defamation claim based on the content of these songs. It's sort of Joe's opinion. There's some factual basis for it. I'm not sure that you could say he was negligent in making this claim if it is indeed false. And you might argue that Carol Baskin is a limited purpose uh, celebrity and, and therefore you would have to use the higher standard for defamation. I don't think that there's gonna be much of a claim here. Ever after just three short hours, nearly four hours, the jury came back finding Joseph Maldonado Passage guilty on all 19 counts, two of those largest ones for the alleged use of interstate commerce for murder for hire. Guilty. I don't know about you, but after watching Tiger King, I had to find out what happened to all these people after the show ended. For better or worse, Joe Exotic is in federal prison in Texas, where he's currently suffering from an infection of the coronavirus. Coronavirus is a really terrible thing, and it's uh, infecting a ton of people in jail because they're in close quarters. I, I highly recommend following Scott Heckinger, who's a public defender in Brooklyn. He's been at the forefront of advocating for prisoners' rights, and I think it's definitely something you should look into because it's not just something that affected Joe Exotic. Uh, Joe has filed a lawsuit seeking nearly $94 million in damages against the Department of Interior uh, and the prosecutors and the, the documentarians behind the show. He's going to lose that suit. I feel very confident. The GW Zoo is still open and is being run by Jeff Lowe, or at least it was open until it was also shut down for coronavirus reasons. As you can imagine, a lot of people want to go there because of the infamy of this show. And to be because we live in the dumbest timeline, Joe is seeking a presidential pardon, and President Trump is actually considering it. I'll take a look. Is that Joe Exotic? That's Joe Exotic. Why? But now let's give Tiger King a grade for legal realism. The characters are completely unbelievable. They're mere caricatures. The dialogue is insane. And the factual scenarios are completely ridiculous. It would never happen. So I give Tiger King an F for legal realism. What? What's that? Oh, oh, it's real life. All right, shut it down. Shut it down. I am never gonna financially recover from this. Now, even though this video is fair use commentary and criticism on this ridiculous documentary, I still get copyright claims all the time because people abuse the legal system. The only thing worse than being mauled by a tiger is getting demonetized, which is why my creator friends and I teamed up to build our own platform where creators don't need to worry about demonetization or the dreaded algorithm. It's called Nebula and we're thrilled to be partnering with CuriosityStream. If you like Tiger King, you'll love Nebula and CuriosityStream because Nebula is a place where creators can do what they do best 
create. It's a place where we can both house our content ad-free and experiment with original content and new series that probably wouldn't work on YouTube. In fact, if you liked this episode of Real Lawyer Reacts, the version I put on Nebula removes this ad and contains a blooper reel. Expired meat. Delicious. One more time. Here we go. Nebula features tons of YouTube's top educational creators like Lindsay Ellis, Half as Interesting, Knowing Better, Real Engineering, and Tirzu, and tons of others. And we get to collaborate in ways that wouldn't work on YouTube, like Tom Scott's amazing game show Money, where he pits a bunch of famous YouTubers against each other in psychological experiments where they can either work together or profit individually. It's so, so good. So what does this have to do with CuriosityStream? Well, as the go-to source for the best documentaries on the internet, they love educational content and educational creators. And we worked out a deal where if you sign up for CuriosityStream with a link in the description, not only will you get a one month free trial for CuriosityStream, but you'll also get a Nebula subscription for free. And to be clear, that Nebula subscription is not a trial. It's free for as long as you're a CuriosityStream member. And for a limited time, CuriosityStream is offering their documentary distancing discount, which gives you 40% off all all of their annual plans and gift cards. So you can stay in and stay curious. And that's $12 a year for both CuriosityStream and Nebula. Since we've got to stay inside anyway, we might as well be soothed by the voice of David Attenborough or take a ride across the universe with Chris Haddonfield or just watch Tom Scott torture your favorite YouTubers. So if you click the link in the description, you'll get both Nebula and CuriosityStream for 40% off or you can go to curiositystream.com slash legal eagle. It's a great way to support this channel and educational content directly for just $12 per year. So click on the link in the description or again, go to curiositystream.com slash legal eagle. Clicking on the link really helps out this channel. So do you agree with my grade for Tiger King for legal realism? Leave your objections in the comments and check out this playlist over here with all of my other legal reactions where if you click it, I'll see you in court.